Hi, everybody. It's so good to see so many faces today. I'm really thrilled that so many of you could join us. I first gave this talk it, at our uh, NSCC conference in Providence, Rhode Island in 2014. And since that time, the pattern book images have been made available thanks to Chris Davenport and the UK Shelley Group. Armed with that information, I was able to update this talk about Old Bo and Shelley China. Unfortunately, recently, the owners of the pattern books have withdrawn permission to use the pattern book images in Zoom talks. So I've now deleted six of my slides that showed patterns that have never been seen. In their place, I'll try to describe each of them as they're seen in the pattern books, and hopefully you can use your imagination to fill in the gaps. In 1938, Shelley produced a pattern that pays homage to the earliest English porcelain. They called it Old Bow. And today I want to tell you about Old Bow China, what it is and why it's important, and more about Shelley's patterns that emulate Old Bow. One of my sources is this treasure of a book called Old Bow China by Egan Mu, which was published in 1909. In the 17th and 18th centuries, people in England and on the continent were captivated by the porcelain that was produced in China and imported to the West by the British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company. This China, as it came to be called, was a combination of white clay called kaolin and a rock called hei tin zhu, which is a silicate of potassium and aluminum. When these materials were ground together, they formed a soft paste, which when fired in a kiln at high temperatures became porcelain. In 1710, two Germans were the first Europeans to discover a way to make porcelain in Meissen, Germany. They were Johann Friedrich Botger and Ehrenfried von Schoenhaus. Of course, this formula was a closely guarded secret. We all know that Meissen became a highly successful and sought after porcelain, which is still in production today. Enter Thomas Fry, an artist and inventor from Ireland who had come to the East End of London in 1734. 10 years later in 1744, he and Edward Highland, a merchant and glassblower from Wales, took out a patent for porcelain using a material from the earth produce of the Cherokee Nation in America, called by the natives Unakur. Although not specified, it is thought that Unakur contained a high proportion of animal bones. The porcelain made from Unakur was extremely dur durable and very white in color, like the porcelain from the East. Later in 1749, Thomas Fry took out a second patent for porcelain, which used the white ash of calcin bones. Brian Highland started to produce porcelain near Stratford Le Beau and the east part of London with financial backing from the Pierce family who were directors in the British East India Company. They called their factory New Canton, which evoked the beauty and quality of the porcelain of the east. Their location near the old Bow Bridge over the River Lee gave the common name to their factory of Bow China and its wares have come to be known as Old Bow. This engraving shows the old bow bridge, which name refers to the three arches shaped like a bow, and it has nothing to do with ribbons. The bridge dates to the 12th century. Old bow china was highly influenced by the decorations seen on wares from China and Japan. Here are some teaware examples of old bow china, photographs courtesy of the Victoria and Albert Museum, London, and the Legion of Honor in San Francisco. The patterns or designs on Old Bow are principally of Chinese landscapes and flowers, such as the hawthorn, chrysanthemum, and peony. One type of wear that was especially beautiful was their raised or embossed white flowers on a white background, such as the two plates shown here. As Egan Mu described in his book, Old Bow China, the early white china which Bo introduced were decorated with a simple sprigs of applied paste under the glaze. What is now called the hawthorn pattern, Bocock wrote of as the sprigged and others termed the mayflower. 
John Bocock was a salesman in the bow factory from 1750 to 1776, and he kept extensive records of patterns and orders. The figure on the bottom right is an example of the sprig or spray of hawthorn used on old bow. The plate on the left with embossed sprigs is circa 1744 to 1755 and was donated to the Victoria and Albert Museum by Lady Charlotte Schreiber, who was a noted collector of early English porcelain. Here are examples of plates done in both round and octagonal shapes. The bow factory also produced vases, urns, and bowls, such as these shown here. Sauce boats, terrines, tea and chocolate pots, and bowls with covers and stands were also produced. Old Bow even made plates in the style of the Seb factory in France, such as this plate shown here. They also made decorative figurines and candlesticks such as these. They do seem reminiscent of figurines produced by Meissen, although never having seen either up close, I can't guess as to the comparative quality. Here are some more old bow figurines. Receipts for the factory tripled from 1750 to 1755 from about 6,000 pounds to 18,000 pounds. At the height of the bow factory's production around 1758, the factory employed 300 workers, 90 of whom were painters. Because their wares were priced to be accessible to the general populace and they were durable, the bow factory was instrumental in helping to change the custom from wood and pewter for everyday tableware to the use of porcelain. Sadly, Highland became bankrupt in 1757, Thomas Fry died of consumption in 1762, and the molds and wares were transferred to William Dewsbury of the Darby Porcelain Factory in Darby in 1776. Although the bow factory production was relatively short-lived, about 30 years, it created a market for porcelain in England and elsewhere that continues to this day. To give an idea of the prices the bow factory charged for certain pieces, figurines range from five shillings to 12 shillings, Milk pots, mugs, and coffee pots were nine shillings. Embossed bowls for salads were 12 shillings, but all of these were considered moderate prices. Here are some marks that have been found on bow china. Not all pieces have a mark. This old bow plate is, is significant because it bears a striking resemblance to one produced by Shelley nearly two centuries later which Shelley called Old Bow. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the Old Bow China plate on the left and Shelley's Old Bow pattern on the right. Pattern 12683, which Shelley introduced in January 1938, they called Old Bow. No doubt it pays homage to the style and decoration of earlier patterns by the Bow Porcelain Factory. It has a special back stamp, Old Bow. Note the placement of the center floral spray and the smaller sprays around the shoulder of the plate, similar to the Old Bow plate we just saw. The largest flower on Shelley's Old Bow is a yellow anemone in the center. The smaller flowers in the center spray include a daisy, morning glory, more anemones, and others which may be hawthorns. When Shelley designed 12683, the sprays of flour around the plate's rim were not embossed, but rather were transfers and then hand enameled. Instead of hawthorn or mayflower blooms, anemones and harebells were used. The style and placement of the flowers show the Eastern influence of old bow china. The use of hand enameling on the Shelley pattern is an added touch. Shelley used a new copper plate, CP410, to produce the transfer for this pattern. Even the bow factory itself had used transfers in addition to hand painting on their wares. Using the photographs of the Shelley pattern books provided by Chris Davenport, I've searched through all the best wear patterns to find every Shelley pattern that used CP410, a total of nine. 
the very next pattern that Shelley produced was also called Old Bow and used CP410. Pattern 12684 differed from the previous one in that the edge and handle were trimmed in gold rather than green. It too was produced on the Cambridge shape. The image shown here is a mock-up using a Cambridge shaped cup together with images of CP410 superimposed on the shape because we cannot show pattern book images in this talk. After consulting with Bruce Till, who keeps the Shelley Group archives, and also with Chris Davenport, we've concluded that no photographs of this pattern exist. It must be rare indeed. Shelley introduced a variation of Old Bow in 1938 that used the same center floral spray as Old Bow, but placed it off center. The colors are striking. Pattern 12764 changed the colors of the flowers, added a dark blue wave pattern border, used different secondary flowers on the rim, and trimmed it in gold. The back stamp did not contain the words old bow. Apparently, Shelley produced this pattern over a period of time because the back stamp on the plate is from 1925 to 1945, while the cup and saucer each have the back stamp for 1945 to 1966. This plate was featured on the back cover of the Shelley Group's magazine in June of 2001. The plate requires a great deal of hand painting and enameling, outlining all the flowers in a maroon color. It too used CP410. In October 2021, Lynn Smith presented a talk on dinner settings of Shelley and showed a dinner table set with this pattern. This was actually a photo of Betty Pomish's table set for dinner and we use her photograph with Betty's permission. This close-up of her place setting shows what a beautiful table Betty sets for a formal dinner, including soup cups in the Chester shape. Two more patterns from 1939 use CP410 for their transfers, namely 13068 and 69. The pattern book images show 10 inch plates with the anemone floral spray in the center surrounded by two different fancy borders, a ribbon light green border on 13068 and a filigree type brown border on 13069. The center large anemone is done in pink and the patterns were also put onto the Gainsborough shape. I've never seen these plates on the wear. I wish I could show you the pattern book images because they are beautiful. Perhaps if I, can, if I can reprint this talk in our NSCC magazine, I can show you the images there. Pattern 13146 uses the same large anemone as the old bow pattern in the center of the plate. It was introduced around 1940. When Ray Reynolds was visiting the US for the 2006 Shelley Conference, he examined this plate and exclaimed that it took five firings to make it. Each of the ground colors, the enameling, and the gold required a separate firing. Because wear is susceptible to breakage each time it is fired, many are lost. Thus, multiple firings raise the cost. I'm lucky enough to have a pair of these plates. 13146 was put onto service plates and the Gainsborough shape. Wouldn't a full tea service be grand? The next use of CP410 was pattern 13172 on the oleander shape. The anemone spray is on the shoulder of the plate and the gold trim and solid handle were of liquid burnished gold, Shelley's finest gold. It was hand enameled in yellow, Turkish blue, pink and shamrock. The gold rim has six gold arch triangles at each of the six notches. The large anemone spray is off center on the shoulder of the plate. The anemone is done with yellow with, and with a pink center. Again, the Shelley Group archives do not have a photo of this pattern, and I've never seen it on the wear. 13232 was also produced on the oleander shape using CP410 with the edge and handle trimmed in ginger. The anemone spray seems to be larger and covers more of the plate surface and is hand enameled in yellow, pink, blue, and green. The large anemone is yellow with a deep pink center. I've never seen this pattern on the wear, 
and the Shelley Group archives do not have an example. The very next pattern, 13233, is trimmed in bright blue, known as D11 at the factory, the same color as the background of this slide. The large anemone is done in pink with purple edge, and as in the previous pattern, the spray covers much of the plate surface. Again, I've never seen this pattern on the wear, and no photographs seem to exist. The Shelley pattern books tell us that pattern 13542 was called Old Bow and produced on the Henley shape with pink and brown border. The entry does not have an in image and it does not mention CP410, but the description is as follows. Old Bow, pink and brown border, liquid gold finish, colored handle. Since we don't have an example on the wear or a pattern book image, we're left to imagine what this unknown example of old bow might have looked like and whether it was ever produced. The final iteration of old bow is Shelley's pattern 13627, introduced about 1951 on the Gainsborough shape. The pattern book entry was made by Ray Reynolds. Shelley called this old bow, as can be seen on the special back stamp. The Edward Walker catalog of 1951 displays the old bow pattern on the Gainsborough shape. Edward Walker Company was Shelley's sole agent in the USA, located in New York City. On page seven of their catalog, old bow is described thus. Hand enameled, rich looking pattern of showy flowers, boldly effective on the distinctively modeled Gainsborough shape. Handles, cup feet, and rims finished in apple green. Happy combination of masterful technique and traditional shape in flawless bone china. The accompanying price list to the catalog tells us that teacups and saucers were $33 per dozen and eight inch plates were $33 per dozen. Open stock dinnerware was available for import only. The sharp-eyed amongst you will notice that this price list mistakenly refers to the pattern number as 13267, but after consulting with Chris Davenport, he agrees that this is a mere transposition of the digits 6 and 2, and it should be 13627. Shelley's later version of Old Bow differs from the earlier version in several ways. The same large anemone spray is now off-center, and the smaller sprays of flowers are different. No longer are they anemones and harebells, but rather tulips, roses, and daisies. The same green trim is used on both patterns. When we compare the central floral sprays of several of these patterns, they all resemble each other, only the colors, placements, and uh, embellishments are different. In 1909, Egan Mew offered some sage advice for the collectors of Old Bow, but I think it applies to us Shelley collectors as well. Let me read to you what he says. The golden way for the collector is to buy what he wants at the average value, making sure that it is what he himself desires. By getting his cabinet together slowly, bit by bit, he need not take great risks in regard to price, while each addition of a good example will enhance the value of those he already holds. It is only when a really good all-around cabinet of bow or Shelley is collected that one Low can battery. that Low one battery. can judge that one can judge of the variety of work and the beauty of many of the pieces which this early factory produced. How true it is. These old bow Shelley patterns are rather uncommon and have not been seen very often. Perhaps they were never very popular and were not produced in great quantities. Or perhaps they've suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. In any event, if they appeal to you, snap them up when you see them. You may thank yourself in time to come. Thank you for listening today. Here's my sources in case any of you are interested. And if any of you have any examples of old bow, I would love to see them. 
And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was lovely. Thank you. Does anyone have uh, an example of oboe or that you would like to show? Oh, there we go. Lynn. Lynn mm. Smith. You'll need to unmute. It doesn't talk. Okay, here's here's one of the one, two, seven, six, four. Beautiful. The dinner plate that Beautiful. was on uh, that Betty Pomish has the dinner service. And I, after I had a picture of it, I found uh, a set of nine of the plates on eBay. Wow. I would love to have any matching pieces, but <laughs> I snatched it. Beautiful. Does anyone have anything else they want to uh, ask about, or perhaps you have something you'd like to share, even if it has nothing to do with old Bo? <laughs> Dave, I have David I, Drayton. I just wanted to say that um, old Bo is uh, something that I know very little about, and how interesting I found the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Here, here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Lee Clark. Uh, I have an example of the Gainsborough cup and saucer. Oh, wonderful. What, what's the number on that one? Um, Is it the one? It's, three? it's handwritten 13629. Actually, it's a seven at the Is end. Is it a seven? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. But that's yeah. that's the later version. Oh, that's beautiful. Isn't that pretty? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank, thank you. you. Super interesting. Yeah. Now I know what I have. <laughs> I couldn't figure out when I first saw it why on earth it was called Old Bow. And so that's what prompted me to look up all of this information. And then when I found this book, uh, I just was, whoops, can't see it. I was just thrilled. <laughs> well, I was looking for ribbons on it, like you referred to <laughs> ribbons, and there were none. So I'm glad to hear what it's all about. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anybody else have something they'd like to mention? Got nothing, have they? Mm. Mm, not 